totally comfortable with thinking in public constantly, and uh, I've become comfortable with that, just thrashing my ideas around. And then uh, I often say that I have questions without answers, and I have answers without questions. They don't neatly fit together. Uh, and you know, that's good. You just have to think about your own creative processes and directions, and the more comfortable you are with your ideas and saying, well, I believe this will work out, uh, that's not about how can kind of leaving time to reevaluate it as you go. So I make uh, sculpture, and uh, it's kind of a funny bullet point there. <laughs> I make sculpture, and I make large and small scale dioramas. Um, and I also make uh, large scale sculptures, or discrete objects. And it's something I'll talk about because I stopped doing it and then want to re-engage it in a different way. I make a lot of drawings or ink on papers. People say they're paintings. They're, they're, to me, they're illustrations, and uh, I work, have been working with what's called integrated media, sort of figuring how we fit into our digital world through interactive objects, and the show Paved is formalizing that thought process now, which is great. Um, it's certainly a stream. So three different streams, generally, and I often show them together. Uh, that started with my grad show, we'll talk about that. And, ideas of trying to bring different dialogues together in the same place. So the first two sentences from my art statement, so the first, uh, first sentence I'll read with you, my work is directed by considering the immensity of place and what it means to be somewhere. I had to get myself permission to do this. Uh, I thought, wow, you know, what's the immensity of place? Is that the universe? And I thought, yeah, that's, that's a good thing. Let's, let's, let's talk about the universe. Where am I in the universe? Um, and then um, I said, well, that's crazy. That's, that's an enormous thing. That it's impossible to connect. But so I said. So I immediately, you know, contradict myself by saying to expand my ideas about place, I explore the possible intersections of site and situation. So I'm very interested in um, what's the here and now. Like well, what's happening now. The past has brought me here. The future I can affect it a little bit. Sure, maybe a little. But uh, I've, I've become very focused on what's occurring in the moment and uh, and how that's functioning. I think that. Uh, comes from the way I, I grew up. I moved a lot. I've lived in all sorts of places in the Arctic. I've lived uh, across Canada. I've lived in Europe. I've lived in the States. Uh, my parents like to move and travel with the military bases. I've lived in tent trailers sometimes on the road. Um, so they're you know, very, uh, a lot of uh, adventure and exploration. It's sort, of, sort of a fun way to grow up. In some ways, it wasn't. You know, you had no stability. So that certainly affected me. I'll talk a little bit about that midway through my talk and how that's kind of affected what I do. So uh, just a TLDR, my early statement. <laughs> the uh, older work, uh, it was lots of topics. It was about place. It was about dystopic, fragmented environments. Uh, it was about moving or transiting through those environments. It was dismantling and rebuilding this constant process, up and down, back and forth, and what it meant to be local, what it meant to have a home. So all that based on how I grew up and, and you know, I think of how a lot of people are affected. Um, you know, it began really young. Uh, we immigrated to Canada from England, so there was always this outsider thing happening as well. So there's these So that was the big sort of wedge that went in. That was the thick end of the wedge. And then recently, I was like, uh, you know, it's way too much to think about. <coughs> I need to cut my thoughts down a bit. So I said, how about I just consider what's going on right now? And then how do I create a document or an archive or a map of that? And that's been my focus. So I still do that through sculpture. I still do that through integrated media. I still do that through drawings. But I really just started thinking about I say that I can summarize my art, my entire practice, but you want to go to the mall. And there's a dot that says you are here. And that's you know for me it's very indicative, and that's sort of why you are not here came around that exhibition. So um, it could just TLDR. That's it. I can just finish now. Do you want to see some pictures of my work? Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, this shed, <laughs> probably a euphemistically say this shed is probably more to do with my artistic education than all uh, all of my formal education combined. And there's a big history of sheds. Uh, I didn't make this, I just found this shed and I just walked by. Um, there's a big history of sheds at art, you know, shed boat shed, uh, the history of the Evans shed, uh, with a cottage, beach cottage, um, you know, lots and lots of sheds um, in art. Um, <coughs> right on the heels of my uh, uh, getting my MFA, I went to the BAMP Center for a really long residency. It was great. The residency was called Figure in a Mountain Landscape, and it was this kind of weird 
exploring yourself within the landscape, exploring yourself within a place that fit in very well to the theme, the topic of the residency. And uh, I was taking a walk. There's a lot of construction there building the new convention center. And um, there was uh, a lot of construction. So this was just a shed off to the side. And uh, it, it kind of, I don't know, if I say spoke to me, do I sound weird? Uh, I thought, wow, you know, that, that actually makes a lot of sense in terms of a thing. You know, it's a, it's a temporary object, it's functional, it's got a purpose. Um, you know, it's shoring up those pipes. And there's a jig attached to the side of it that I don't, I don't quite know what it does, but it's very purpose built. It kind of looks like a constructivist work. And, uh, you know, there's these, these useful tools around it as well. There's this kind of demarcation into the front of it. You know, there's an obvious intervention that's happened. You know, it's a, you know, a whoops moment, I'm sure, with the front end loader. And I can't remember, I think it was locked. So, you know, this you know, kind of expanding a little bit, this privileged knowledge inside of it is valuable and all this. Uh, I just said somehow this made sense to me. And then the surroundings, because of the construction, there was these temporary mechanical uh, you know, installations, gas lines and so on and so forth. And then with a, yet another temporary layer on top of that, these wooden um, <clears throat> kind of protectors or cross beams or whatever you want to call them. Then a fence around that as well. It wasn't a very good fence, you just put it in the back of it. Um, but you know, so this kind of facade and so on. And, and all of this kind of started speaking to me because I was thinking a lot about dystopic environments, crumbling environments, and I was thinking about um, living up north where uh, almost all the buildings, there's no solid foundations, all the buildings are in some sort of uh, stilts or, or, or structure that is a, is a kind of flexible structure because of the permafrost, the cycles, so if you have a foundation it will crack and then you know there's this kind of entropy that happens, um, so there's a permanent thing and a temporary thing and they interact together and that, you know, that, for me that was really important um, because that's how I grew up as well in these temporary situations. Um, so that shed, those structures reflecting in real life, coming back on the heels of making an exhibition that was talking about that in between state or a temporary state it really worked for me. So my grad exhibition in 2007, 2007 yeah. uh, was called Mobile Auxiliary. And, and with this, I really wanted to say that art is just a part of a dialogue when you walk into the gallery space. Um, it's going to support another dialogue. It can be a global dialogue, um, but it, it may not define the, the dialogue. It will just give you some indication. Uh, it'll help you have your own conversation. The viewer in the gallery is always being, or a person in a site, or someone in place, has always been of interest to me. That's probably because of arriving at campsites in the night, and having a setup, uh, living in rental houses, and all these things. So that idea that. Um, Examining place and finding a dialogue in place has always been really critically important. So, with that exhibition, I started making dioramas, which was, I think, they just came out of the ether. I probably was looking at other artists, and I said, you know, I want a small world for someone to inhabit. Something about the haptic, you know, I want to go in and touch there, I want to be in there. I have to, sh I have to shrink myself down to be in that world. And um, I started making a lot of drawings about machines and airplanes and these dystopic crumbling building worlds that um, had some sort of conversation with uh, living in flux and um, kind of, uh, let's say crumbling spaces or spaces that are constantly seen and rebuilt. And then uh, I also was building large scale work at the same time. So the vehicles that I was using to transit these landscapes uh, started to manifest in actual size. So that, that was the sort of Started it all, went to the BAM Center um, afterwards. And, you know, so, so, and starting using uh, models and uh, ready made objects, making narratives, but narratives that didn't really have a lot of explanation. I think that if I hadn't uh, been, if I hadn't gone down the art route, I would have probably been like a professional modeler working for a, a museum and building models. It, it's something I really like to do competing with building model airplanes. It seems really fun to me. You know? Just sit in my room by myself and do this. And then when I was doing this, a lot of the thought process was about time and expanding time, and, and so you know all these big thoughts that were, uh, were were coming up early on. So I'm going to continue down the the diorama stream for a while, and then shift to the sculpture stream, and then shift to the drawing stream. So um, 
So this is a, a this is a body of work. I built these iceberg dioramas and put them on these kind of big uh, roller coaster kind of plinths or support systems, and then they them so they're very rough, and then they themselves go into the crates, and then the crates get shipped up. These got really good traction; they've been shown across the country, uh, and they went to Eastern Edge right when all the icebergs, the real icebergs, were going by, and as this is kind of humor. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting to make an artifact of maybe something that will disappear in the future when the polar caps melt. Or... So very much thinking about the museum and um, and trying to create a, you know, a facsimile of something, representation of it. I've had I've shown them in really weird places. This is Ice Follies in North Bay, Ontario. It's a great festival. I really suggest that you apply and go uh, if you can, if you accept it. Um, do some pretty amazing projects. So I spent a week out there. Um, and then built this translucent hot thing, the blue white thing, and, uh, and then put the dioramas inside. So they're not really frail, they're not really fragile objects. They currently live on my parents' driveway. Um, <laughs> they're slowly disintegrating. Uh, but the nice thing was is that I could clear the snow off the ground so that what you were standing on ice, looking at icebergs, it was this kind of great conversation that was happening. So they've had, they were, they were really good, uh, you know, fun objects to move around. Um, and I, you know why? I don't know. Maybe I was saying I need these objects that are in transit, that float around, right, that, that are you know they're unique and so on. Maybe I need to create some sort of thing. I need to identify with them or something in that effect. So that's so like I said. Sometimes I make things and I don't really have the answers for them. So and then I also build solar lights inside of the, the shed so you can see it at night. Uh, contained environments. So uh, beginning with site installation, site-specific installation, uh, thinking about environments for people to go in and how that works for them. Uh, this is a show from Hamilton. This is 2012. Yeah. Overnight Camping is a show that uh, talked about the fact there was no space in the wilderness that was real wilderness, um, that everything is controlled and managed and is resource-based and everything is looked at in terms of its commerce and its, its worth. You really get this impression when you're in Vamp, I'll show you that, uh, a few more pictures about that later, would, because it's such a regulated environment, but it's supposed to be this pristine wilderness. It is, if you get far enough away. Anyway, so maybe I was watching, uh, I was living in Calgary, taught at ACAD when I was making these things on my kitchen table. Um, and I was teaching 3D animation, so there's all these ideas about Polygon, there's 3D printing in here, uh, there's digital, I probably watched the guitar when I was making these things. Um, I don't know if it was even out then, or you know what, what goes into the flow. So there were these kind of ships, these power structures, these unique little objects, and in my mind's eye, I was like, you know, these should be installations, these should be able to turn on. I wanted to have, I wanted to install UV lights in the gallery so that it would power solar panels on the objects that would power the objects. So this weird cycle, it's kind of, and you know, but then but, meh, people are coming to get, you know, you could, it might be unhealthy to have people to stand under UV lights. So anyway, um, that's something to think about. Um, so these little these little structures, these little structures are kind of uh, generated some idea. Yeah, this there's a really good essay online. Uh, Irene uh, Locke Lim, she's the director, or used to be the director of. Um, Hamilton Arts Center, and she wrote a really nice essay about the, these, these, these things going through space and, and their possible collision and so on. Are, are these powered? Do, do they move? Or do they, they only move when small children back them like pinatas in the gallery, which is really a lot of my work looks like toys and they get them played with, so I'm getting really used to that. I don't really care. Um, but no, but they, 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 the conversation came up to the point, and I'm actually re engaging this idea along with the icebergs. Uh, for the Dunlop, so there's going to be yet another turnaround. Um, will those be powered? I hope, maybe, we'll see. Uh, they're coming, and that's coming, though. So again, this is a really good example of, just think out loud, just put the work out there as best as you can make it, uh, and the conversation will happen. Um, and if you look silly doing it, oh well, right? It's art, it's okay. Um, somehow, eventually, everyone takes you seriously. So, <laughs> just, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's on its way. Uh, when they are powered marks, so like, you know, you can hang them up somewhere. So. Again, going back to this idea of toy modeling, um, I up. So shifting into large scale work, this is the show at the Harbor Front, the group show, uh, Tyler Brett, Emily Atkinson, Allison Norlin, and a few other people that I'm certainly forgetting. Um, so those are the two, my two objects in the front. Um, 
I was working with large scale objects and these ideas about vehicles and that they, they were vehicles that they, they're an extension of what I was doing in undergrad as well, but I was trying to say, well, can I build a vehicle that could go somewhere but that doesn't really have an explicit uh, purpose to it? Um, and then I got into this uh, really weird uh, way of thinking that uh, sort of building quarter scale things, so there's this camper boat in the background, which is quarter scale, but they all flat pack like an Ikea box. So they're really fun for preps. They love taking them apart. Um, but I think maybe that the dialogue started to, be, started to get lost a little bit. But taking that idea that, you know, I wasn't really creating an area, I wasn't really talking about anything one specific, uh, I then took it on to say, well, I'm going to make objects that are above a lost narrative or a narrative that someone's rebuilt. Do you guys have chairs? Um, um, so, you know, like a lost narrative or, or and, and this is probably sitting in the studio drawing, watching documentaries that are reconstructions of actual events. So there's like this kind of constant pollution into, into my thought process. So I, I started to take actual things from history that, and then try to rewrite those narratives and then take those narratives and illustrate them through the object to the point where when you look at it, you just have to like start sorting out your, your own ideas. This is loosely based on um, Paul Grayson pouring paint on the paint on the Canadian Charter. It's called the one good copy of the Canadian Charter um, because he's protesting cruise missile uh, testing in Coldwell, Alberta. Uh, since during the 80s, he was an art student. Uh, he went to jail for a few months and uh, hasn't really had an art career since. Um, but so that's the start of this. I was saying, can I take Canadiana? Can I can I take these like, really small little folklorish tales and then start building work from there, uh, you know, reconstruct the narrative that's already being reconstructed that I just reconstructed for you. So those layers was became really important. And then thinking about uh, how do I build things that look like that are hollow, you know, that seem like power structures that are hollow. Um, you know, certainly that uh, still still want to convince you, still want to reach out and, and convince you. Um, and there's also this real thought process that when I'm working that I, I want to work through material process based, like that's a, a lot where my interests lie. And that's where I'm going with large scale work, is that I'm starting to move away from an idea that I need to tell some sort of narrative with it. How about I just work with the material and process it and see what happens? So, I, you know, that again, I have to give myself permission. I, for a while, I thought work, it has to mean something. And then uh, I'm just getting comfortable with the fact that it doesn't have to really mean anything. Maybe it would be just nice to look at. These, these objects are sort of nice to look at. They're sort of sort of fun to make. Um, you know, certainly had a lot of help making them. Um, I'm not sure that the people that sanded this were really happy about it. But this one is um, this one's called Graft. Uh, something like 400 White Lies. And that was enough or something. To that effect. It, it was the last year that they put hood scoops on Camaros. So I bought off Kijiji two of these hood scoops, which were fake. They were just decoration. They didn't actually do anything. They were plug. And then in the process, I had to go to people's houses, like hot rod car guys, and say, well, I'm going to buy. And they were really interested in the car that I was building, because of course they had Camaros. So you know, I had to sort of lie about the Camaro that I was building. <laughs> so, and then stuck them on this wooden frame that was unfinished, but yet it was sanded to the point where it was a really glossy, shiny object. And, but yet it was still in a complete state of unfinished. Yeah, but when, when you met them, did you wear a mullet plate? I, no, I had them all the time. Oh, no, great. Just, <laughs> <laughs> so I actually bought a number of them. I only used two of them, and my dad actually went and picked one up. And uh, he said it was a really curious experience. <laughs> so, actually, that's all he said. And then just mailed it to me. So, but it, it's kind of funny. It was, it was the last, uh, when I, you know, kind of the last word shift, uh, Disco Macho Cool. It's like, I'll put it, let's move on here, but it won't do anything. So, I don't know. I just, uh, there's a lot of humor in, 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 in my work, or a lot of. I, I, I tend to need to entertain myself quite a bit when I'm making work. Um, and I think that comes through a little bit in the illustrations. There, uh, there, there are kind of, there's a melancholia, there's a dystopia in them, but at the same time, I really also like the idea of making something which is attractive to look at and that draws people in. Um, so this is, uh, this, I haven't, this is just a, well, this is kind of a test. Um, so I'm currently very loosely working on a collective um, project called Point of Attachment that looks specifically at how work is put together, how work is processed in the gallery, uh, how does it go on the walls, and also looking at the idea, can we make large-scale sculpture without uh, 
the, all the logistics that are involved in shipping a you know a 400 pound piece of wood and plaster mm -hmm. across the country. So this this sculpture is entirely purchased at Walmart and Canadian Tire, mm -hmm. and held together with duct tape. So this is the <laughs> this is where this thinking process is going. And of course, uh, so, you know, say, well, can I make a large scale sculpture? Sure. This one's already about five feet tall. If I bought another couple of air mattresses, fold them and put them on top, it would, I think that would be good, right? That would start getting into that ridiculous uh, over over top over the top kind of uh, uh, look. So. You know, or maybe it doesn't need the boat in the body, it just needs to be these columns, a more formal presentation of the material. So this is, you know, this is the thought process that's happening now. Um, can, I, can I engage with the community and buy things off Kijiji, like I did in the past? Um, so for example, truck caps is something we're thinking about. And can I then put those in the gallery? And how does that work? How do you take an object and then reinvent the, uh, the idea behind it? And then what happens when the show comes down? Do you sell those items again? Do you give them away? Or do they just go in the bin? So it's, it's a way of, I mean, it's just a different footprint in that sense. You're, you're exploiting another resource. And so, so anyway, that's, that's where the, the large sculpture works at. I'm really hoping to re-engage large-scale sculpture in a way which is uh, a lot more, uh, I don't, what's the, what would be even the term for it? Easier? Less shipping? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Logistic light? Mm -hmm. L-I-T-E dash? Trademark? Okay. So when I was going back to Banff, 2008, um, if you've ever been to Banff, and you've stayed at Banff Springs Hotel, you, you might have taken the cable car up the mountain to the, the Sulphur Mountain. And it's one of the low mountains in the middle of the range, so you can see all the other mountains. Here's my terrible attempt at a panorama and the like Photoshop. Okay, so left and right side. So when you go up, you take the cable car up to the top, um, and it's a really overrun tourist area with a chip shop, and you can know, look and feed chips to the mountain goats and so on. But, um, <laughs> There's a radio tower that you can go to, and there's a little deck, an observation deck you go around. So they've painted the surrounding mountains on the observation tower deck, which is really quite bizarre. So, <laughs> see all, so this idea of the simulacra, the fake, and the real, and your, your sandwich between there with all these kind of mechanical communication devices and directions, and that's ah, great, this, this actually really works in my thinking process. Um, so my roommate Adam taking a photograph into the landscape. People actually looked at this later in strange. I was photographing him, photographing the fake landscape. Um, <laughs> anyway, so there's there's a lot of you know when you go to look at when you go somewhere new, there's all that kind of disjunction and, and things that kind of appear to you, and you're looking at it. Uh, you look at it with a different eye. You can look at a shed. You can look at a mural. So there was those two things: the shed and this mural. Um, and then this photograph, which I took. This is just a selfie. Um, so. There's a lot of group activity happening, but I didn't really like to participate too much in the group activity. I didn't like the idea of kind of hauling my art supplies out and going making it work outside. I like, they had a great studio. They provided these amazing studios. I wanted to sit in the studio, drink coffee, and draw. So, but I like also you know, climbing and, and hiking. So I go out to these hikes, and what's called scrambling, is when you go up the sides of non-technical mountain climbing. And so this is almost at the top of Mount Birdmore, a little bit overlooking this valley. And when I when I took pictures, this was kind of like, oh, I should probably send this to my folks or something like this. And then when I looked at it later, I said, wow, this is like a tableau. It, it's like a painting behind me. And if you look at it, it starts to flatten. I think it's the atmosphere as well, the haze. So it becomes this painting, and there's that snow ledge that just drops off. And the more I looked at it, the more bizarre it, it, it became. Um, the more it flattened, the more it was like standing in front of a very complex uh, back, you know, those scene painter paintings for films or what have you. Um, so it, and that thought process and my inherent social laziness said, well, how can, I, how can I make a project that engages with the mountains without you know, the topic of the residency? You don't have to make that work, but it's, you know, they prompt you to think in these ways, and they provide you resources and talks. And um, so I said, well, maybe I could just you know, you know, look on Google Earth and make that the easy way to do it. So I started looking on Google Earth at all. That's the Banff Center, and I, mean, I can't remember what that is. It's not Rundle, but it's... I don't remember all the mountain names. So, and then in doing so, I went back to what I used to know, because I used to do web design and illustration. And so I said, well, OK, I'll just pop that into Illustrator and make a vector-based drawing so that I could possibly print it out at some point. Didn't really know what I was doing. And then the one thing that I did was is that anywhere that there was human intervention into the landscape, I cut that out and didn't draw that. So I just filled in the natural or the, the, info, you know, the, info, the, the real environment, not the built environment. Um, I ran through the printer, 42 by 24 or something to this effect. They came out of the printer, 
when I picked them up, they were upside down. And then <coughs> to me, it started, I said, wow, this is about a, a flat landscape. This is about growing up on the prairies. This is about being in the Arctic, Arctic ice. This is, this is about a landscape. This is a way to kind of just quickly subvert the dialogue um, without trying too hard. So um, this is one that is about mapping and topography, and this is this unique little place, and this is one that's about water. Um, and there are these little contained there. The dioramas have shifted to the two-dimensional now. And uh, there's about eight of these in total that deal with minerals, ice, uh, landforms. I can't even remember what else. Um, and then they're all called by their mountain names. So there you go, mountain names, but they're flat landscapes. And then they, they've been shown across the US and Canada. <laughs> they just keep going uh, around, which is kind of great. Um, somehow they're very seductive little places for people to park in and think about stuff. So uh, it was a, very much a process to get here. I didn't rationalize it too much. I said, it's good. It's a, it's a way to make a map. I like it. I'm going to carry on with that. Uh, and then the spin-off project from that, which is actually informing the, the new body of drawing in a way to present work, so I don't have to put it in a frame, because framing is expensive. So a spin-off from that is sort of making these little watercolors um, and then of specific places, so from photographs. But I do plan air with paint with my father, so that's kind of fun as well. So maybe that will be part of the project, is to make landscape paintings with him and then turn it into gallery work. Um, so it was paper and then creating observation decks of 3D, 2D, and these were tiny little, various little works. And then that work went, um, it's been shown in libraries and any kind of small venue. So this is like an ongoing kind of sketch. So they just get another tangent of thought um, from that. So, um, again, so I grew up in lots of strange places. Uh, fun, weird, but not great for stability. This is one of those seminal images from the family photo album. It's a parade at the fire department. This is in Churchill, Hudson Bay out to the right, Tundra to the left, nothing out there, north. Um, and it was an anti-smoking kind of pitch for the fire department. There's a lot of fires happening. And I was smoking in bed. But for me, seeing this house on wheels that you could see into, that was pulled by an emergency vehicle, and the little dialogue starts saying, OK, I think that's how I'm living this kind of weird state of urgency or something. So this is literally my backyard uh, when I was growing up in Churchill. Churchill actually represented a period of stability. It was three years we spent there before moving further up north. Um, so NASA was testing rockets. Uh, B-52s were landing on the runways. Um, we lived on the base. And so that, you know, this, but on, on days off, when you could just go walk around the machines. There's no security. There's, so this is, you, know, you could go into the helicopters as well, right? or, or all the planes that were there. The hangars were always open. Different day and age, I'm sure, you know, now that with uh, guards and so on and so forth. Um, so you know, this is a, a direct, you know, as a kid, this is, I'm growing up in these strange environments. But here's an archive photograph of Churchill. The base actually no longer exists. The runway still does to the left. It's a big, huge L-shaped runway. And then that hanger that I just showed you is that one at the very back. And then that row of houses on the left is in the front of that. And then to the left is uh, Hudson Bay. And then this way, so we're looking south here. And then you know, this way, it's north up to actual Fort Church and where the fort is in the, uh, the old fort. Um, no roads fly in, airplanes. So that has a real um, you know, connection and to some of the drawings that I've started making. And uh, the old and the new. So you find you know, Comatic on the left and a snow machine on the right. And Comatic, you know, even that's a new version of one because that would have been built from whalebone. And then oftentimes you would see sheds on top of those. Hunters would go out with their entire family, spend a couple months on the ice, hunting and fishing, and come back. So this, this whole idea of transient and the whole idea of uh, this, this house that moves and site is being flexible and it's all very much packaged into that upbringing. Uh, going back to undergrad, uh, I was building these objects for, I did a double major, and I was building these objects, sculpture, and I wanted to build machines that had, looked like they used to have a function, used to have a purpose, uh, looked like there was a history to them, but you couldn't, you couldn't define what they were anymore. So this is about 13 feet long, so I completely made of scrap materials and just found objects in the dumpster and then work to sit together in some manner. Uh, I found that if you find old armchairs and take them apart, they often have hardwood inside of them, so it's maple and oak that build these really you know, proddy looking derelict machines. Um, so I built a number of these things, and, uh, and uh, 
that came from my, my undergrad show. But that's a kind of that's the, the stream that's coming out of living up north and being around machinery. And then of course planes, you know, the North for laws and aviation practices and everything. So they became a, 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 a dialogue that was constant in, in my, my drawing processes. So this is I think this is in my grad show. Um, there's a there's a longer story attached to this one. I won't get into it. It's uh, uh, about watching the plane being dismantled at the airport uh, to load a coffin into the plane that they couldn't get it through the side door, so they just took the nose off and stuffed it in, which is a northern way of doing things. Take the plane apart, put it back together, and fly away. So I was just like, I remember watching this as a kid, thinking there's a permanent thing happening, and someone that the impermanency of life, the permanency of death, the permanency of you know a plane, and then else gets stuffed together and flies away. Just, yeah, it was very, uh, it was very kind of poignant moment that sits in my head watching. It was like yeah, it was a good afternoon of watching them try to take apart a plane and put it back together, and then watching it fly away. <laughs> kind of fun. So cargo planes, ideas of delivery, and it's very much about living in the north. So again, um, engaging illustration. Uh, you know, uh, uh, cargo planes is the family sedan, with the wood paneling on the side. We had a station wagon with wood paneling, um, and on and on. So. There, there's that idea of, of goods in delivery or objects, mechanical objects. And again, they are being put together, taken apart, there's something going on in them. And then going back a little bit to taking real events, so the Canadian, uh, when the, the Russian Marine satellite crashed in the Arctic and spread radiation across the Arctic in the 70s, and uh, you know, it was claimed that it was a Marine satellite, probably a spy satellite. So I was looking at actual historic events and trying to illustrate them. So wood paneled satellites with Airport-like structures, and and oh, I think too part of this part of this drawing in that real gap between the the, the the infrastructure was me trying to make room for the viewer and say, well, come into this narrative, and but you got to figure it out. It's a strange place to be. I'm not sure we can really resolve it. Uh, there's lots of pieces to put together here. Uh, so moving closer to home, <coughs> this is the you are not here from Art Placement. Um, kind of always trust your own dialogues. This work almost made it into the garbage. And since it was so bad, I said, oh, I should show it. So you kind of trust your bad work, it will do things for you. And uh, this, the, the, it comes out of this kind of farcical lampoon, but there's a very kind of serious side to it saying, um, you know, I'm not there anymore. You're not there when I'm making this. There, there's a disconnect between the object and the producer and the consumer and all these things. So for me, that's a very kind of important idea to figure out how work exists after you finish with it, how it goes out into space. Uh, and how is it consumed, how do people interact with it, and so on and so forth. And then uh, there was elements that I, I wanted to see if I could draw and paint realistically in certain ways. Uh, and then there was ideas like the digital. I don't actually have a really big conversation about these works. I have to qualify them in November. And I'm still working on two of them for the dumb option, so I'm changing two of the works. And um, yeah, I'll probably have more of a rationale for these works when I get to, uh, to, to, get to November 5th. Um, all the works have numbers, so one part of it is about mapping. It's about this kind of patchwork of, of ideas. It's about uh, thinking that um, you know there's a, you know we live in a, in a country that has is being divided by numbers. It's a Western form of organization that you know treaty numbers that are being laid upon uh, a map that you know our maps being laid upon like six other maps that have existed through time. And so, so there's as a constant idea of flux and change and. Uh, yeah, maps. So, and then they're 42 wide, 24 high, and they're all panoramas purposely so that they give this idea of landscape or empty landscapes or open landscapes. And then I just got into painting this caribou into every single one of them um, and trying to paint it as realistically as possible. Um, so, and I made these works when I was moving and I was changing studios, and so they just became this really disjointed, sort of broken up body of work that I kept re-engaging and trying to re-engage. There's little digital artifacts in them, there's all these, there's notes to myself and so on and so forth, the visual notes. So um, yeah, that's where they sit, so I, I don't even know, they're, they're kind of new and uh, there might be in between work, they're kind of like when your hair is not long enough, but not short enough. So <laughs> there might be another body of work that comes after this, I'm sure there will be. Uh, <coughs> I'll talk very briefly, we're almost at the end, and then I'll show you a couple of videos that are about one minute long each. Um, Part of traveling, part of, of collecting work, and I've been doing this since 2009, about 1,500 images. And I've just taken photographs when I go um, to residencies and travel, 
And instead of, you know, I think the normal photographs of people and things like that, but I also try to look for formal objects in the landscape and objects that are dividing the horizon. And I, it's a kind of dirty minimalism. I call it evidence of post-minimal activity. Um, and I'm going to do something with these images and they're maybe have people write about them and curate them in some ways. I don't know. So, but it's a part of an ongoing project. It's been a five-year, five-year plan or five-year project, and uh, it's very curious to look back to where I was when I took this photograph. So these markers that become really, really important. Um, saying, "Wow, that was five years ago, and what was I doing?" Um, things change. So again, looking for formal things in the in the landscape or in buildings that could be construed as art or constructions or artistic constructions, but they're not. They're just um, these generated images, ways to divide this is the horizon, ways to change what's going on, um, ways of thinking about it. Layers, again, uh, that have a site specificity, but then don't really have in one particular uh, place in mind. Uh, focusing, and then it's all, I don't try to, to overly crop the work or overly process the work. I don't do any kind of post-processing. I just take the photograph and then see what I get out of it. So that's one project, which is, um, about this, this kind of collection of thoughts and seeing what I can do with it. I'm going to four or five images and a couple of videos and we're done. So well, these are these are studio um, residency projects and this is what's led me to doing the show at Cave. I, I like the idea of, of an interactive space. <clears throat> I recently read my undergrad application portfolio statement and I was quite surprised that it said um, I want to build interactive environments that people come going to. And I remember thinking at the time, I didn't know what interactive environments were, and then I realized what I'd done is I'd opened up an art magazine, mm -hmm. and I found that the new thing, is that the new thing was interactive environments, and I, so I copied that down into my application mm -hmm. to sound sophisticated. <laughs> and then applied. And the only thing I applied was because my father promised me money to go to California and to Mexico. So I applied to art school to get the cash to go on a trip, and then when I came back, I was accepted to university. Damn. So I had a very accidental route into school. Um, and then once in the institution, you never leave. So anyway, this is, uh, this is like the worst honky tonk in the world. I wanted to make a piece. I had two doors to the studio, and there was a side door, and people kept coming in my side door, even though there was a front door of the studio building, and the old fire hall in Johnson, Vermont. And uh, so I, I kind of, I sort of like, you know, I didn't mind, but people would just open the door and come in. They go, oh, sorry. And then they close the door and walk away. Well, no, I'm married to apologize. And um, so, so I, I built this cannon trap thing to, uh, to, to, to make them regret walking in. And I'll show you a video and you'll see why. Uh, and then based on that idea of interacting with people, uh, one night I built a campfire in my studio out of some cotton batting and some, some scrap paper and an old fan motor and some Christmas lights, and it turned out for about a week and a half, it was like the most happening social place at the residency. So people, well, there's also a way to get free beer. Um, so people would come by my studio in the evening and, uh, and hang out, which was pretty fun. Um, but it was bizarre, this, because the cotton batting movement. I'll show you a video about that, too. Um, so it was these two things that was, it was a very kind of uh, just accidental way, a DIY way to engage with the community around. Uh, and it was a really fun residency. Everyone was building these these engaging projects or projects that you know had, um, had had somehow brought people in. I needed my studio back after about a week and a half, so I turfed it. I think my liver couldn't take the evenings out. So, um, but uh, so I took the project. So um, let me go back and I'll show you the sound cannon or the honky tonk from hell, and I'll show you the um, the, uh, the video. So I'll just finish up with this one. This is the film of Walker New. So I met Kyle Beal, he's a Calgary artist, and Jason Shepard, he's an American artist in New York, and uh, we did a collaboration at AKA under the uh, spoof theory called Resistentialism, which is a 1950s theory which was uh, uh, countering existentialism, and it was a theory that objects behave badly, so when you put your keys in your pocket, they'll fall in the snowbank, your zipper will break, you'll spill water in your pants in the bathroom, and so on and so forth. So we, we built objects and documented things behaving badly so it should it's not buttoned up properly and uh, put it all into AKA. And, and this is one of the sort of first formal interactive pieces that I built this dread door opener, which um, probably is a workplace safety hazard. And uh, it would trigger when you walk by, and then of course the, the wire would run up and down the track and this thing would flail around wildly in the gallery, uh, right at eye level. So I really quite liked this kind of horrible thing. It sounded terrible too, just pretty and so forth. So, that takes me up to 
inviting people into the gallery and saying, hey, come spend some time in the gallery. So TLDR uh, opens tomorrow, and it's a much softer, gentler, nicer space to be in. It's about marking your place in the gallery for a little while, and then it all disappears. And it's a, it's a kind of show of stages. If uh, you're by yourself, it has a very soft way of being. Uh, you can control the environment a little bit. Um, so it's a, it's a, if there's lots of people, the space is activated differently. So there's many different states and many reasons to come back and visit, despite the fact that I'm saying, well, it's just a shorthand version of making the show. So we'll leave that. I'll play the two videos, and then we can carry on with our day. Thanks for your patience. And if you want to wrap this up soon as we can get going. There we go. Um, so yeah. And I don't know if the speakers are plugged in, so I'll just play it off my laptop. The shittier the sound, the better, actually. So let's see what I mean. Let's see. Open with no C. <laughs> Open with nothing. <laughs> okay, let's see what happens. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> So it's Lucky Fizzell's party can go on in the record. And if you trigger it, you get trapped in the song, just like the singer is trapped in the heartache of heartache by the numbers. Keep coming back for more. So it really curbed traffic in my studio once and built that thing. So okay, that's enough. You never get this line back in your life. Stop. Okay. Okay. And uh, I'll just play you the cap flyer and then we'll wrap up the words. There we go. We never forget the same time. So the studio campfire was a much more um, a lot nice. Sorry about the old poor documentation, but you get the idea. And, and I think I built this because I felt that the environment was cold and I just, I don't know, maybe I was feeling homesick or something and I just wanted... This is the first day I built it. And it was just literally out of junk that was lying around. Okay. I'm sure none of these things are, you know, those that safe electrical connections. We can talk about that. And on the back wall, this is the, uh, this is the, the first incarnation of the iceberg. So a lot of ideas get percolated at residencies. Hot glue is a great way to stick things together. Didn't know it would be such a success, but apparently you can get it. And it's like one of the big fireplaces in the grandma's house. Thank you, everyone. Oh, yeah. Do we need applicants for it? Is that that? Uh, I think space is limited, space but is limited. Uh, maybe just describe what it is. Uh, I'm conducting an Arduino workshop on Saturday at Page Arts upstairs in the production center at 1? <laughs> yeah, it's online. And um, there there's, might be space available. And so it's, a, it's a beginner workshop to start working with Arduinos. So instead of using garage door openers and trip wires and all sorts of other mechanical things like that, uh, you know, as a microcontroller and a, a one, two, three, how to get going. <clears throat> At the end of the day, uh, you'll have enough information to build yourself um, an interactive nightlight that will turn on when you go to the bathroom and turn off and come back, or do funky things in black that you know, make you worried. And, and you can even set it on timers. So, but that I'm going. Hopefully, you'll walk away. It's a three-hour introduction to Arduino microcontroller, and um, if you come and take the, the, it's, the space is limited. But if you come and take it, you should have enough knowledge to get going. So.
for being the cultures of pitfalls, so limitations of the It's atypical of paved arts workshops in that it does cost money because you actually do get an Arduino micro microcontroller uh, and, and you, you walk away with or yeah. learn from it. <laughs> but it is a very popular instrument for a lot of interactive installation work. The things. entire installation, the TLDR, is 20 Arduinos, 20 motors, and 20 lights. And the reason for that is that if one breaks down, it's not a big deal. So, that's, uh, so we have be a paid you can just uh, slide me a few bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do that to get a show. Just always want to know the cost of things. So how much is the workshop? Uh, how much do they have to slide you? I've got a couple here. I actually don't know if you have to be a member. Space is limited. I, I, I'm, I think maybe, what would you say is a maximum number? Two? One more person. One lucky one uh, more job. I'm not sure how many people are I think it's eight. I think there's six so yeah. far. Uh, Riley Forbes at, at Paved Arts at um, uh, 6525502 extension 2, no extension 3. <laughs> I'm, going uh, to, I'm going to meet with Riley today and if you're interested yeah. just give him a call and I'll yeah. find out exactly how much stuff we have. If you are interested in being a Paved Arts member, all of our workshops are free to Paved Arts members except for ones where you get things like our Except for the ones I can do. <laughs> and uh, it's 25 bucks a year for students. So. Hey, quit plugging your gallery for my talk. Yeah, no, that's good to know. Yeah, it's <laughs> like less than... Go be a paid member. It's good. Go be an AKA member as well. Just speak volunteer. in student terms. It's yes. less than a, uh, an eighth ounce. Of I mean, coffee. Of coffee, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm on the board of Latitude 53 uh, in Edmonton, the artist run in Edmonton, and the thing is, is that the volunteers, the student volunteers, become the people that are employed in the gallery once they graduate. So it's a way to start into the world of working in, in the artist runs and administration, and it's a, it's a way to make a little cash as well. Is there any other questions? Since I might be meeting with your, you know, be meeting with your class for a while, so if you have questions. Your opening is tomorrow night. Tomorrow night at seven, seven, yeah. At seven seven o'clock for the talk. talk. So, yeah, eight come at eight. The <laughs> and the talk will involve a walkthrough as well. Yep. In the light and in the dark. In the dark. In the dark. In the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Just, just you know, about uh, our words of David Lynch. Not the star. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks again. Yeah, one talk now. One talk tomorrow. Yeah, good. 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 Good.